My task this evening is to share with you first timers the inspiring story of the work of Hope Academy. And for those of you who've heard our story before, don't worry, I think I've got a fresh twist on the story that will also keep you engaged. You know, in thinking about the founding of Hope Academy, I've been helped recently by wrestling with the unique ways that Hope Academy is a private school that exists for the public good. I would guess that almost every one of you in the room tonight is here because you have an interest in the public good. Why else would you respond to an invitation to hear about a school doing great things in the inner city? You know, it was that same concern for the good of my neighbors that led me to move into the inner city 28 years ago. In 1991, my wife Phyllis and I were looking to buy our first home in Minneapolis, and we asked ourselves, if followers of Jesus were called to be the light of the world, what part of our city was most in need of the light of the gospel? Maybe we should move there. Well, everyone knows that in Minneapolis, there's one neighborhood almost nobody wants to live in. It's called the Phillips neighborhood. You're in it right now. And for decades, it's been known primarily for two things, extreme poverty and violent crime. Home to 17,000 residents, most of us in the Phillips neighborhood don't own our, our own homes. 80% of my neighbors are renters, and most of us move several times a year. Half of us in the neighborhood live below the federal poverty level, and in 1996, when over 40 homicides occurred in one year in this neighborhood, state troopers were sent into the area to patrol our streets. Each Monday morning, I receive an email from the commander of the 3rd Precinct outlining the arrests made during the previous week within a four-block area around this building. In a typical week, there are usually 20 drug arrests, 25 arrests for prostitution, and three arrests for robbery. On top of this, Phillips has the highest concentration of registered sex offenders living in it of any neighborhood in the state. And in the last month, there were three homicides within a four-block area of the school. You, you may have even read about the recent homicide that took place on Tuesday afternoon at the SA, just, just over uh, down here on Bloomington Avenue. You know, when my father heard that we were buying a house in Phillips, you know what he said? Russ, you're an idiot. <laughs> Everybody knows, he said, that you buy a house as an investment. You know, your investment's going to decrease in value every year. You're going to be paying an annual tax for the privilege of living in Phillips. But against his advice, 28 years ago, we bought our home three blocks from here. We're still living there today. And as our children became school age, my wife and I began to understand that the poverty and crime in our neighborhood had a deeper root there was an education crisis in our neighborhood of which I was largely ignorant. But pretty soon, I discovered some really uh, important things. I've, I learned that over half of my neighbors here in Phillips were not going to graduate from high school. I learned that those neighbors of mine who did graduate from high school would on average only be able to read at an eighth grade level. I learned that our state, which we think of ourselves as the education state, also had the largest achievement gap between whites and students of color of any state in the country, which meant that my neighbors of color were getting some of the worst education in the whole country. I discovered that the majority of boys who aren't reading books by third grade were probably going to spend some time in prison during their lifetimes. You know, in, in 2010, when, they, when filmmakers made a documentary about the national urban education crisis, you know what they called it? Waiting for Superman. Well, like all parents, my wife and I wanted a great education for our own kids, so what did we do? When they became school age, we decided to drive our kids 10 miles across town to attend a great Christian school in the wealthiest neighborhood of the Twin Cities. Well, this solution 
actually created a massive problem for us because, of course, we had moved into Phillips to be a light to our neighbors. And now we were forced to ask ourselves another disturbing question. What does it mean to really love your neighbor as yourself? Wanting to justify myself like the expert in the law whom Jesus had told to love his neighbor, I asked myself, well, and who's my neighbor? Let me tell you about what life is like for a, a girl that I'll call Jasmine, a typical teenage girl living on my block. Jasmine usually misses one or two days of school each week. And when she goes to her, when she goes to her neighborhood school, she's often exhausted. She doesn't sleep well because she's fearful from hearing so many gunshots fired around her apartment. She and her mom and her two younger brothers moved twice last year. They hardly have any furniture in the apartment, no art on the walls, only a kitchen table and a mattress on the floor. The few personal things Jasmine has are still in a box from last month's move. Her dad's in prison, and her mom works two part-time jobs. One during the graveyard shift, and because her mom sleeps in the morning, Jasmine has to get her brothers up herself and get them ready for school. Sometimes there's no food in the cupboards or in the refrigerator, but she and her brothers receive breakfast and lunch at school. School's a pretty chaotic place. There are fights in the halls almost every day, and her classmates frequently swear at the teachers. Nothing's ever really done about it. Drugs are offered for sale, to her every day. Jasmine's not on track to graduate. She doesn't understand what's going on in math class. Well, she hasn't for years. And so she doesn't do the homework. But nobody at school seems to really care anyway. Having been sexually abused by an uncle a few years ago, Jasmine struggles with depression. She wants to play on the basketball team at school, but her mom said she can't because she has to take care of her brothers after school. She can't risk taking them outside to the park to play because it's not safe. She's never been on a family vacation, never even visited suburbs like Woodbury or Eden Prairie, even though she's heard about them and wonders what they're like. If she's like most of her friends, Jasmine will probably have a child and drop out of her high school before graduating. Jasmine is my neighbor, and Jasmine is your neighbor, too. So what could it mean to love Jasmine as myself? Every month, a different church or ministry group comes into the park right next door here, PV Park, and serves a meal to the poor. Can you guess what's always on the menu? I bet you can. It's almost always hot dogs. And to be honest, if I was going to serve my neighbors with an education, it would probably be a hot dog kind of education. Even though none of us wants that kind of school for our own kids, do we? And if we want a filet mignon education for our own kids, wouldn't Jesus encourage us to desire that same kind of education for our neighbors? Well, like the priest in the story of the Good Samaritan, for six years, each morning, I would put my kids in the back seat of our car, and as I took them to school, I would drive right around my neighbor's kids who were trapped in failing schools. <laughs> I'd often wave to them, and sometimes in frustration, I would shoot up a prayer <laughs> and ask God, God, would you please tell someone to do something about this problem? And the Lord must have often smiled like I can see many of you are and said, well, there is this one guy named Russ that I've put there, but Russ has got two big problems. First, he's got a hard head, but you know what's even worse? Russ has got a hard heart. Because I knew that starting a school like Hope Academy would completely upset my nice little life. I would need to quit my job. I had a great job that I loved. I had a wife and three young children to support. What was I thinking? You know, to be honest, I wasn't even qualified to lead my block club, much less lead a school. I didn't even have a teacher's license. I didn't have a school building. I didn't have any teachers. What was I thinking of doing? And on top of all that, 
quitting my job to start a school would look so foolish to all my family and friends. I was an elder at my church. Elders don't do reckless things like that, do they? Was I willing to be thought a fool for Christ? I knew that if I quit my job to start hope, there was no going back. And I remember praying, Father, if there's any other way to love my neighbors without quitting my job, please show me how. Could I love my neighbor only without the sacrifice? And that's where God gave me a very special friendship. God introduced me to my dear friend, Jeff Bird, right over here. During my first meeting with Jeff, Completely out of the blue, he asked, he said, say, do you know anything about Christian, starting Christian schools in the inner city? I, I thought I must have misheard him. And so I asked him to repeat himself, and he said that he had a growing sense that God wanted him to start a school for inner city kids. <laughs> to which I said, what? You too? You know, Jeff and I, were amazed to discover that God had separately given the same eight convictions to both of us. We both believe, first, that the miseducation of inner city youth was one of the most important justice issues of our day. Second, we believed that one of the best strategies to redeem and transform the inner city was a great school. Third, we believed that all children are image bearers of God. And so the school would have to be a remarkable school, not just an average one. It'd have to be the kind of school that we would want our own kids to attend. Fourth, we believed that mankind's chief problem is sin. And that Christ is a great savior from sin. And so the school would need to be based on the gospel and on the teachings of Christ. We believed that parents couldn't and shouldn't be ignored, but they had to be deeply involved in the solution, and they had to have some skin in the game. And we believed it was essential to do the really hard work of holding teachers, parents, and students accountable for their responsibilities. Seventh, we believed that results really do matter and that we had to actually close the achievement gap. And finally, we believed that others living outside the neighborhood would actually rejoice to partner with inner city children to make this kind of school affordable for everyone. What a friend. <laughs> and so by God's grace, with newfound courage, I walked into my boss's office in September of 1999 and I told him I was quitting in order to start a school for my neighbors with my new friend Jeff. <laughs> I think my boss thought I was an idiot. <laughs> Are you sensing a theme here? Well, after deciding to start a school for our neighbors, Jeff and I had to answer two questions. First, what kind of school would best serve a girl like Jasmine? And second, could a private school have a significant impact on the public good? You know, like many of us, I had heard the criticism that private schools were elitist inwardly focused, and a threat to the public good. Well, we wanted to have a school that would graduate selfless, compassionate citizens who would seek the public good of our community. How might Hope Academy graduates who are well-formed citizens of the heavenly city be a gift to the citizens of the earthly city? In other words, in what sense is Hope Academy a private school that exists for the public good? Let me show you five ways. First, it's a public good that all the children in our city are welcome to attend Hope Academy. 75% of our students are non-white. 70% are from high poverty homes. 33% are from homes where English is not the heart language of the family. Second, it's a public good that instead of being stuck in free schools that are failing, all the children at Hope Academy are wonderfully provided for. On average, each child receives a $10,000 scholarship each year. 
so that a Hope Academy education is affordable for everyone. Third, at a time when most of us agree that the fabric of our city is unraveling, it's a great public good that Hope Academy graduates are the very kinds of citizens most needed for our city to thrive. Now, arguably, with only seven graduating classes so far, the jury is still out on this, but those first graduating classes are already showing amazing promise of this. Let me give you some examples. For instance, I believe our city needs graduates who will lead strong families, don't you? In a day when 80% of African-American children in Hennepin County are born to single parents, Abraham Norman, a 2014 Hope Academy graduate said, I want to be a husband and a father to my children. And this Hillsdale College graduate married his sweetheart between his sophomore and junior years at college. You know, I believe our city needs graduates who will seek justice. Ariana Owens, another Hope graduate, worked for two years with AmeriCorps to address our nation's urban education crisis. I believe our city needs citizens who will live virtuous lives. Do you know this year that seven or eight Hope grads have returned to tutor and mentor younger students at Hope? I believe our city needs citizens who will be economically productive, prosperous, and generous. Just the other day, uh, we were thrilled to hear that one of our first graduates has signed up to give back and become a regular monthly supporter of students at Hope. You know, I, I believe our city needs future leaders who qualified to lead our city's most important institutions. Do you know that 10 of our recent graduates have received the Act 6 Leadership Fellowship that's awarded annually to the most promising urban seniors in the Twin Cities? You know what the leaders of that program tell us? They say they can spot a Hope Academy senior from a mile away. Don't you think that these are the kinds of young people who would be a blessing to our city? I sure do. You know, fourth, a Hope Academy is a public good in that it trains youth in Socratic discussion and classical rhetoric so they can enter the public square and thoughtfully and respectfully participate in public debate on the most important issues of our day. By the way, did, did any of you have a brief conversation with one of our students on the way into the building this evening? If you did, then you know what I mean. Fifth and finally, hope is a public good in that we prepare students to exhibit the kind of character traits like integrity and respect for authority and self-control that are desperately needed for a democracy to thrive, right? We need people who believe, for instance, that there really is right and wrong. And we need people who believe that you really do need to get your work done on time. And it's not only our graduates who are doing these things. Even those students who come under the influence of our teachers for only a few years and then move on, they tell us about the life-changing impact. Last spring, one of our partners was over here at Abbott Northwestern Hospital to have a heart bypass surgery. One of his nurses, Lydia Dompte, saw a Hope Academy notebook on his bedside table, and she said to him, you know Hope Academy? That's where I went to school for three years before my family moved out to Blaine. That school changed my life, and it's the reason I'm doing what I'm doing today. <laughs> little did Jeff and I know how God would use our little steps of faith to build a great Christ-centered school for urban youth, a school today serving over 500 students from 350 families. You know, day after day, we're seeing that same group of high-poverty, at-risk students beat all the odds and become successful beyond our wildest dreams. They're reading the great books. They're studying Latin and calculus. They're getting into great colleges and coming back to this neighborhood to serve our community. You know, as the Lord provides, our five-year plan, it's called Growing Hope. It's a plan to grow this student body by 40%. 
and to serve 200 more inner city youth with a remarkable education. Of course, each new student will need a financial partner in order to come. You know, maybe you see the same eight truths that Jeff and I did. If so, we invite you to join with hundreds of us as friends and help us to change the world. A few minutes ago, you heard Hannah and Elijah recite Isaiah 61, which affirms their intention to grow into oaks of righteousness. Did you know that the very next verse of that prophecy says that someday a future people of God will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated, and they will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Did you catch those three verbs? Rebuild, restore, renew. <laughs> Sounds like a public good to me. How I pray that our graduates will be a gift to our Twin Cities. Hope Academy, it's a private school that serves the public good. <laughs>